I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where we meet today and recognise that this land has always been under their custodianship. I am on the land of the Yakara and Yugara people. I invite you to write in the chat room the country that you are on and I pay my respect to elders past and present. Today we welcome Mark Wilson to this special workshop as part of the Australia Reads campaign. Mark Wilson is a multiple award-winning author illustrator with 17 books in print worldwide in nine languages. Mark has a particular passion for Australian history and the environment, particularly endangered animals, exploring these themes through his picture books and workshop. Mark has won five Royal Zoological Society or Whitley Awards for children's literature, 11 BCA Children's Book Awards, three Wilderness Society Picture Book Awards, and was shortlisted in the third CG CJ Picture Book Awards International. He was also presented with the 2011 Gromke Medal for Services to Children's Literature. His most recent picture book, Eureka, a story of the gold fields. Mark will now share with you the research he carries out when writing and illustrating picture books with a focus on history. Fair, you are welcome, Mark. Please give him a wave and applause. Thank you. Hello, everybody. And thank you very much for inviting me into your session here. And uh, thanks, everyone, for that lovely intro. And, oh, sorry, uh, and I'm going to immediately butt in by saying something I should have said, which was get a journal or a paper with some papers and a pencil, please. And we'll save questions for the last 20 minutes. And now I will be quiet. No, all good. All good. I was about to say that myself, actually. <laughs> you saved, what, 20 words then? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, here we all are again in cyberspace. Isn't this wonderful? Um, yeah, cyberspace. In Melbourne, we're still wearing these little things. And we'll be for a couple of weeks yet. And using a lot of this stuff. So you can see um, cyberspace is very handy for us. Um, I imagine you can all get around and go out for coffees and whatever you like up there. But uh, we're just about to open up a little bit and we can do that. The coffee shops are just opening and uh, so it's very exciting for us. We've been doing this for about six or seven months now. In fact, I've lost count or track. It might be the wrong year even. I don't know. It's all confusing. So here we are. But we keep working, don't we? That's one beautiful thing about being an illustrator or a writer. <laughs> You've got no excuse for not uh, writing. Uh, even pandemics don't stop us. See, we're pretty resilient, aren't we? So here we are. Look, I'm, uh, I've been invited here because uh, I have a, um, a bit of a background, mainly in illustration, but uh, um, not so long ago, I started writing my own stories and they went uh, pretty well. So here I am as an, an author and an illustrator. But really I'm uh, an illustrator at heart. And I, I actually think in pictures. I don't, I don't really think like I imagine authors, um, real authors do. And I've spoken to some real authors. <laughs> and I, am a, I know some of you are as well. And uh, there are a few things that I've learned over the journey that are probably handy. Uh, a lot of them you probably already know. Um, like one of my big tips is um, read everything you can lay your hands on. Uh, that's probably one of the biggest tips I'll ever give potential writers. But you probably know that already anyway. Um, it's the love of writing that probably gets us into wanting to be a writer or an illustrator anyway. Um, I was in, I was always inspired by really, really um, um, strong words and strong sentences by people. Um, people like the Dalai Lama or John Lennon, um, songwriters, all sorts of people. And they would move me um, emotionally and that's what I've always responded to. And then I've taken words like uh, the words John Lennon wrote from Ajahn and I just spent my spare time trying to illustrate those words just for fun um so that's pretty much how i roll everything has to be an emotional response okay i don't call and that's why to get back to why i don't call myself a writer an author uh, is because i don't um 
practice as an author, I just respond emotionally to situations, um, an endangered animal, um, slavery, the, con the convicts, all that sort of thing. I have to have an emotional response and feel it to be motivated to make a book, uh, either as an illustrator, author, or both. So, and I'm, I still love working with authors. I am a bit of a control freak. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get that out of the way straight away. I'm a bit of a control freak. And uh, years ago, I was just an illustrator and I was working for a, a very famous author. And I'd done seven books with him. And um, uh, I learned on the grapevine through a friend of mine, he was looking for another illustrator. So I went into panic mode because I'd worked for this one person and this one publisher for about eight years. So I um, put together a couple of quick stories and took them to my publisher, who was his publisher as well. And they said, the publisher said, um, Helen Chamberlain was her name. You, some of you probably know her. Um, she, oh, one of the best editors ever. She said, Mark, we love your work and offered me a double contract <laughs> as an author. So when people say you have to struggle, you have to do this and that. I didn't. So I can't tell people you have to struggle and just keep going. Well, you do. You have to keep going. You have to have a lot of self-confidence too. But I'm sure if I didn't know Helen really well, I may not have taken those stories to her. And I may not be a writer today. If she'd been a stranger and I had to front a new publisher, a new editor, I'm not sure then I'd have had the confidence to do that. So it's a lot of it's luck, but a lot of it's just keeping on writing. Okay, look, I'll get, I'll get one thing out of the way because it's distracting and it's, it's very, very important, all right? I want you to write this down. I know you all know this, but write it down anyway. And I'll show you why. A little byline, you don't have to write this down. Never lose hope though. It only gets better. <laughs> I'll show you why. This is the first draft of Eureka, a story of the goldfields. Now, I don't know how clearly my uh, camera's coming through, but it's the first draft and I've already changed it. That's the first draft of Eureka, okay? First page of the first draft. First page of the second draft. So I've rewritten it, changed it, rewritten it again, and changed it again. Fourth draft. Massive paragraphs taken out and new ones put in. First page of the fifth, sixth draft, fifth and sixth draft. Right? And on it goes until you get to 14. <laughs> don't despair never lose hope I know a lot of people when I get to that stage say, I can't write, rewrite my story 14 times well if you're writing a novel you're not going to write it 14 times are you but if you're making picture books poems, short stories, song lyrics or anything you have to keep working on it it's a piece of art it's a development it's a progression from your last piece of art it's an improvement on your last writing, your last story, your last poem. It's all a progression that just takes you two steps forward and one step back, two steps forward, one step back, all the time. That's how it goes. Sometimes you'll have a breakthrough and think, this is brilliant, and other times you'll spend three days on something, and then it goes in the bin. <laughs> I know I've done it many, many times. So I'll give you a, a couple of other little clues as well. Write everything you can. Write letters, poems, songs, anything. Write things down all the time. It's like somebody who plays a musical instrument. The ones who are really good, they sit there with their guitar or their piano all the time, just tinkering away, getting so familiar with it, so familiar with their craft that it's second nature. It's like sport or music. Art is no different. Writing's no different. It's practice. 
every single moment you are thinking of writing is part of that progress, part of that development. So write, write, write. And letters, writing letters is a lost art. But I know my father was in Vietnam years ago and uh, I was in the army actually, in the Australian army at the same time. We wrote to each other. And I've, I've actually still got uh, some of those letters and I realized they were a really good way of, of structuring thoughts. So the simple art of writing a letter, so I've, I've, I've ditched the emails unless it's for work, and now I write people letters and mail them off. It's, it's an art form and it's a great um, little arm to your writing process, okay? It helps you clarify very simple ideas. And it's like any, any storytelling, a letter is you're telling a story to the person you're writing to. You're telling them probably lots of little stories about your family, your work, whatever you're doing, you're writing, okay? This is all really good practice. Your first draft is your worst draft, so get qualified people to read it and don't ignore what they say. I get my, I do 14 drafts of a story before I show it to my daughter or my wife, Roz. They always have changes because I'm so familiar with the story, I'm so familiar with it, I can leave something out and don't notice it because it's in there, it's in my head. It may not be in the writing, but somebody else will see that gap, will see that little link isn't there or that development of that character, okay, or that bridge that the boy somehow magically gets the other side of the river from, okay? All these things, somebody fresh will see them. That's very, very important, right? Never, ever give up. <laughs> I'll give you three or four little facts, okay? The Thornbirds, Colleen McCulloch, she presented that 27 times to publishers, all rejected, before it was accepted. Now it's still one of the best selling books in the world, The Thornbirds, okay? Uh, Bryce Courtney, The Power of One, the first publisher he took it to threw it in the bin and said, This is rubbish. I'd suggest you find a day job. That same publisher rang him back three months ago when he heard he was on a plane to America uh, to sign a deal for that book. And that same publisher who'd thrown it in the bin offered him $1 million advance. So never give up. Your book is probably brilliant, but some publishers cannot see it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> publishers and editors aren't the end of the world. They aren't the police, right? So you've got to have confidence. That's the most important thing I'll tell you today, I think, apart from uh, your first draft is your worst draft. So there's a lot of important things, uh, in my opinion. Last but not least, writing tips. This is the fourth one. Read as much as you can of different genres, styles, and everything. I'm reading at the moment Bernard Cornwall. I'm reading Philip Nielsen. I'm reading all sorts of stuff. And they are all completely different writers. And every day at some stage, I'll pick up a Lee Hobbs book, Old Tom, or any of them, okay? Just to remind me how good it is to be part of children's publishing. It's, a, it's fantastic, okay? And you've got to remember to keep grounded. If you're going to write for children, and some of you are, I don't know how many of you are writing for adults or both or whatever, but writing's writing as far as I'm concerned. Your audience is number one, the most important thing. That's why I'm doing Zoom and Skype sessions. I've been in 23 different schools in the last three weeks around Book Week, all over Australia. And we have a question and answer. The kids tell me what they're thinking. They tell me what they think about my characters, my books, okay? That's my audience. Stay in touch with your audience. Don't go away to a little hut in the forest and spend three years there writing your novel because then you lose touch with the people. You lose touch with your audience. It's really important to stay in touch with them, okay? Now, a little bit about what I do. What motivates me and passion, all right? Uh, I'm going to send this little sheet of tips, all right? I'll send that to Jenny. So you don't have to write all that down at any stage or whatever. They're just ideas, right? They're just little prompts. 
So when you think or you, you get a bit of writer's block or you just think, oh, this is too hard, you just say, right, read something. Don't have to write. Read something, okay? Uh, there's all these ways through it. It's a, it's a process. It's a creative process. And as a creator, you're going to have moments when everything stops and you just think, oh, this is all too much. All right? But you've got to press on. Now, what motivates me is I like little things, right? I found this dog tag, right? In, in my father's, when my father died, I found this little dog tag. I'll show you. I don't know if that comes up close. There it is. That's his dog tag from Second World War. He was in Hiroshima um, and uh, part of the occupying forces in Hiroshima. And uh, he was in Vietnam too. He was assigned to the American Force Vietnam. And uh, I wanted to do a book about him uh, called Vietnam Diary. But, and I just was totally blocked. And then I picked this up one day and I thought, oh, yeah. I'll use the dog tag as the key to the story. So it's the smallest, it's the tiniest little things that can motivate your big story, your next novel, whatever. It's tiny little things. And I can't emphasize that enough, tiny, tiny little things. I'll show you one of the smallest things I've got, okay? Right here. It's a piece of gold. They're tiny little pieces of gold, okay? My friend, uh, a friend of mine up at Ballarat, Tony, he found them. He was a, um, a very well-paid um, executive in a business. Very rich man. He gave it all away to go gold prospect. That's emotion. That's what I responded to. I thought, yeah, gold has driven people to some crazy things, including my mate Tony. And I thought, I'll do a story about the gold fields. It was that simple. He handed me his gold. He said, Mark, this is the latest stuff I've found. I put it all in a jar, okay? I bought it off him, put it in a jar, and I thought, that's my next story. Tiny things, that wouldn't, each fleck in there wouldn't be bigger than a pinhead, okay? But that's the story of gold, and that is a big part of the story of Australia and us, okay? And if we look back through our history, uh, we'll probably find a family member associated with the gold fields, that sort of thing. Okay, so there's lots and lots of little things. This locket here, I found this little locket in a shop and there, and I tried to open it, I couldn't open it. So it's a little gold locket, okay? Found it in a sort of an op shop. I tried to open it and it doesn't matter what I do, I cannot open it. So it's been glued shut. So I thought, okay, I'll try and imagine what's in it. I don't want to wreck it by opening it. So it's still a mystery to me what is inside it. It may be a photograph. It may be there's something moving in it, right? So I don't know what it is. Could be a little pearl. Um, I don't know. It could be a staple. I've got no idea. But my imagination gets me every single day. So I made this little locket the central, basically the central character of Eureka, a story of the gold fields, the locket, okay? And so the only thing the little girl brings from England because they've got no money. They had the father, the mother dies in England. The father has to spend every cent he has to buy passage to Australia to look for gold. And the only thing they bring to Australia is this little gold locker. So I always focus on the little things. They inspire me to write these stories and do the stories. And I'm inspired to put them in the stories as well. So the things I've showed you are all in the different books. Vietnam Diary, Eureka, a story of the gold fields. Never lose hope. Okay. Story of Australia's first school. All those little things. Um, the, the most amazing thing about Australia's um, never, never lose hope, Australia's first school, was they didn't have any books. They didn't have any paper. They didn't have any pens. Okay. The English people, I'll call them, <laughs> for want of a more descriptive word at the moment, uh, sent us out here with nothing, absolutely nothing, not even thread to uh, mend clothes or fishing nets, uh, no paper to learn with, not a teacher, didn't, put, didn't think of putting one teacher on one of those nine boats, no. They pretty much wanted us to disappear, but we didn't, did we? So that's sort of about the first school, but it's also a, it's a story about hope and the fact that we can overcome all sorts of things 
with a lot of grit and determination, uh, which we have. In fact, when the, when the Lady Penrahan, the, the ship with the first fleet that had all the women and children on it, left the dock in England, the uh, authorities and the captain of the Penrahan deliberately left all the women and children's clothing and belongings on the wharf, just sitting there for anybody to take or whatever, just left it and sailed away to Australia. That's how much they thought of us and what the outcome would be. So those women and children left with barely the clothes on their back. That was it. Nothing to eat with, not even a, a pannikin or a little spoon or anything like that. Okay. So these are the stories I try to tell and try to tell them realistically. So if you read any of my books, like Never Lose Hope, um, they have the realism in them that we tend to and have in our past and in our schools pretend it didn't happen. The first fleet, oh, this wonderful big migration in history to that date, oh, apart from about three others, but that's what I was taught anyway. I know the Chinese had one massive migration through Southeast Asia with 10 times more ships than we had in the first fleet, but that's our history. I've tried to correct all these funny little uh, things in history that are pretty obvious. So it's not as if I discovered them. In fact, Jackie French passes on a lot of things to me. She discovers things and then I write about them, some of them. So uh, that's what I try to do. I'm trying to correct a bit of history. I'm trying to show how bad things were. Um, those kids who came out with the first fleet, this young bloke, John Hudson, they were slaves like any other slaves. In that picture, you can see kids all over the world today. They're kids today. And I've used them as inspiration for my two characters in Never Lose Hope and Beth, the story of a child convict. They were slaves, okay? And kids are suffering that every day, today. So I try, that's what, uh, where my passion comes through. I have to tell stories uh, about these people to make these everybody else aware of what is happening in our past and in, in our present or we don't learn and our future is just like our future with war we have a war we don't learn from it then there's another one we pick a president and then we have to pick another one you know what I mean we never seem to learn so I want kids to know the real story of our past so that they can learn from that and say yeah we don't want kids to be slaves anymore Okay, we don't want people to be downtrodden and whipped or flogged or hung for, you know, stealing a handkerchief. These are things from our past and we need to learn from them. So, that's, they are my passions, right? I'll get rid of these books. This is my other passion. There we go. There goes the thylacine. He's run off. Run off on me. This book is... To me, uh, one of the most important books, it is the most important book I've ever done, okay? And that's because of this beautiful creature here. This book is called A New Prayer for the Animals, okay? There was another one called A Prayer for the Animals 10 years ago. So I did this as an anniversary present to myself because nobody listened to the first prayer for the animal, uh, or at least not many. A lot of kids did, but no one else. So this is another one. And I'll tell you why. This beautiful creature has a name. Her name is Najan. She has a daughter called Fatwa. They are the last two northern white rhinos on earth. Poachers have taken the rest of them over the last 10 years. Okay. Najan, N-A-J-I-N. She's a northern white rhino. When she dies, her species dies with her, okay? All these creatures in this book are critically endangered. I haven't put a koala in it because that's going in the next one, which I'm already working on. But our government refuses to list koalas as endangered. They are endangered. The bushfires wiped out they are tens of thousands of them. There's a disease affecting the rest of them. So in five or six years, our government may deem it appropriate to put it on the endangered species list. 
I'm trying to get the message out there. So are a lot of other people. I'm not trying to do this on my own. We need to save these creatures and their habitat now. And if we, if we still, if people still deny climate change, it's just going to get worse. And we'll be looking at mass extinction. Kangaroo Island was affected by those fires and there are two creatures on that island that are possibly extinct because of the fires there. The Kangaroo Island Dunnart and a couple of species of snake, okay? So we may have lost, we may have had three extinctions on one island in those bushfires. We have to stop this now and that's part of my, part of my DNA now. I have to do these books and I struggle because Publishers go, oh, yeah, we don't want to do another animal book, Mark. We've done about 500,000 already. Yeah, but this is different. These are animals that need to be saved. I'm not just trying to write another spot. You know, these are books, these are books that have a message that have to be um, adhered to now. Or our kids won't be able to see elephants or uh, kangaroos or quolls or sea turtles. You know, it won't happen because they'll be gone. Sea turtles are highly endangered, but we'll get into that when we start drawing later. There's a little hint for you, hey? <laughs> right. Now, very quickly, before we start from drawing, these are things that are super important to me. Um, research. Very first thing I do before I start a book is not make notes, I make pictures, okay? Now, if you can see this, I don't know how clear this is on the screen. This is a, um, this is a pile of uh, photographs, sketches I've done, uh, guys in uniform. A soldier came back from Afghanistan and um, he had post-traumatic stress syndrome and he wrote a little story about how frustrating it was for his little kid, his little boy, to know what he was doing. So we did a book together. Uh, we're trying to get a publisher for it, but um, we don't know what's going on there, but I'm gonna do it anyway. So first thing I do, I just get lots and lots and lots of reference photos and I make drawings of things. I just muck around. It's like a scrapbook of ideas for an idea, okay? From that, I might make a few notes. Um, and then from that, I might do a painting. But that's how it starts. Every book starts like this. It's like a notice board of bits and pieces, okay? Or I might even have, I've cleaned this up. I've cleaned this one up because I've shown this to kids in school. But I might have notes here with little arrows going, oh, you'll look like this, but I'll give him a helmet instead of a slouch hat. Uh, he'll have a backpack on, but he gets wounded in the shoulder, so I can't have a backpack. You won't see when, blah, blah, blah. Uh, will he be wearing a gas mask? Little gas mask I've drawn here. All that sort of thing, right? That's how every book starts. Re massive amount of research, visual research and written research. All right, I'll throw that out of the way over there. Now, this comes out early next year. It's a story about Rachel Pratt. It's a picture book. Rachel Pratt was an Aussie nurse First World War, she um, was working on soldiers in France when the German planes came over at the hospital tent and decided to drop bombs on it. Uh, Rachel kept working. Everybody else was running for the trenches to hide. She said, no, my soldiers need me, kept working. A bomb went off behind her and threw her forward. And when she got up, she could barely breathe. She had uh, shrapnel from the bomb had gone into her back and through into her lung and another bit into her shoulder. So she got up, she checked herself, she checked her breathing, which was a bit shallow already. She said, oh, no, I'm all right, I can keep working. And went back to work, looking after her patients. Rachel Pratt is her name. And I thought, all these other people have been given recognition for what they did. And I thought, she barely even got a medal for it. And um, I thought, I'll tell her story because the nurses, to me, um, at any stage, um, are pretty important, as we've learned recently with the pandemic too. So uh, I did that, okay. So I make lots and lots of notes. I I'll download every single primary source 
of information I can. Only primary sources. I can't emphasize that enough, right? If you Google something, make sure it's a diary, a letter, a first hand, or an observer of the actual scene you're writing about. Jackie French taught me that when I first started writing, okay? And that is probably one of the most important things I've ever learned. I'll tell you what, somebody will ring you up or email you if you have the slightest thing wrong in your book. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not talking about commas and full marks, right? Everything has to be spot on, even in a children's book. Primary sources and hopefully three different versions of that event, okay? Jackie taught me that and it's very important. So primary sources, a diary, in other words, or an observer who was there. I'll take that. That's not actually a primary source. It's an observer, but I'll... For history's sake, I'm calling that a primary source. Best thing is letters and diaries, okay? Not newspaper articles. I've used them before and they can be dodgy depending on the journalist at the time and what agenda they had. And we know uh, journalists can be biased, don't we? Just watch Fox uh, News for five minutes. Find out, find out all about uh, bias. Right, now, use your imagination. I don't care if you're writing a history book, a recipe book, it doesn't matter. Use your imagination. That's why we've got one. We need to use it. I use it for everything. I had to, this is, this is actually, this picture here was my first published illustration. Look at that. This is actually it. This, I did it on watercolor paper. Uh, now I'll, paint on anything. I don't care what it is. I thought, oh yeah, I'll be an artist. I'll use some really uh, expensive watercolour paper today. My first illustration. <laughs> and good I did because it's still in one piece. Some of the other things I do, they've fallen apart. See? So there we go. Use your imagination. I had to create, a, I think it was a water monster or something. And uh, so I used my imagination. And there it is in Pursuit Magazine, all published up. See? That's my first published um, illustration so use your imagination even if it is a realistic story i had to do a um a story about an evil wombat at one stage my this was my first published book actually okay was written by a story written by philip nelson which is pretty weird by the way if you ever find this in your library it is really weird it, it's the strangest little story. And I was asked, this was my first published um, book. And I read the story and I thought, what is he on about? I had no idea what he, and the end, it's one of those endings, there's no ending. It just sort of meanders off, right? It's about an evil wombat. So I had to use my imagination to create it. So I created this for, for the publisher, thinking she'd be really impressed. <laughs> that was my evil wombat. I couldn't use a real wombat because they don't look evil. So I used a fox, a rat, and an echidna combined to make a wombat, okay, that we could call evil. <laughs> so even doing a realistic book about a realistic animal, I still had to use my imagination. That's how it goes, right? Philip was using his imagination when he wrote it. <laughs> And one day I'll ask him what the, what the ending is supposed to mean. But I couldn't work it out, so I did this, look. That's the ending illustration. It's an open window and some footsteps leading away into the snow, okay? <laughs> that's my interpretation of an ending that's pretty weird, right? You'll get that if you ever illustrate for somebody else. You'll think, hang on, what's this bit about? Um, that's a beautiful thing about writing. It's all different, isn't it? Right. Now we're going to do a little drawing thing because this is important. Okay. Have you all got a couple of pieces of paper and a grey lead pencil? That's all you need. You don't need um, a $250,000 set of derwents. Just a grey lead pencil. You don't need an eraser and you don't need pencil sharpener unless you're really heavy with your hand
And while you're getting them ready, I'll show you this picture. This is from the new prayer for the animals. That's a tiger. A Bengal tiger. It's extinct in the wild, a beautiful creature. But every, every child who's in a writing class with me or adult or anybody, and I, I, I say to them, right, don't write it about anything unless you're passionate about it. I'm passionate about the endangered animals. So I ask every potential writer these questions. What do you hope for in your life, in your writing, anything? Just write it down. What do you hope for? And the weirdest things will pop into people's heads. You think, well, oh, world peace, you know, um, a president who can represent us or a prime minister, blah, blah, blah. People come up with the weirdest things, you know. Somebody said the other day, oh, just a really good Danish me <laughs> today. <laughs> a Danish. I said, well, what's a Danish? You know, and then I had to look it up. I looked up a cookbook. I hadn't done that for a long time. Cooking book. What's a Danish anyway? So what do you care about? What do you hope for? What do you care about? If you can answer those two questions on any given day, you can write anything. Okay? You can write anything. That's the key to it. Just look at yourself and what you're thinking. Your whole life is built around writing and family and all these things. Write about them. Seven of my books are, are about my family. All right? So before we, before we start drawing, I just want to emphasize, look at your own families for your stories. I started this, my mother's eyes is actually my mother but it's about my grandmother. I wrote this and did this story. It's about my grandfather who went to war, First World War. He was a boy soldier. He was only 15 when he left, okay? Uh, a soldier had come to his school and he, the principal and his soldier came to my grandpa's grade six class at Merriweather Primary School in New South Wales, okay? And told the boys in grade six, we need soldiers. All the men are dying and being killed overseas. We need you boys to sign up. So we're going to make you uh, do um, uh, some training after school for six weeks, and then we'll send you down to, uh, just quietly between us, of course, uh, send you down to Sydney to be soldiers. And I know that's a fact because he wrote, wrote it all down. Okay? And it's coming out now that they, were, they went around to schools in the First World War in 1916-17, to recruit boys to be soldiers. And my grandpa was one of them. So I wrote this story to explain all that to my grandkids, okay? It's now my bestseller, 20,000 copies sold, and it's in its fourth edition, right? It's, a, it's basically a diary about my grandpa. So don't go past, all right, your own family, your own history, your own stories, right? Kids say to me, oh, he was a hero, wasn't he? Went off to war. Well, he wasn't. He was a boy soldier. And he, he was in a battle called the Battle of Bulacor for a good seven minutes before he was gassed and wounded. So he was in the war, in the battle for seven minutes for the entire First World War. So he wasn't a hero, although I, I reckon he was just going in the first place. Um, but there it is. So that's my best-selling book. Seven of my others, Vietnam Diary is about myself and my father in the 60s and the Vietnam War. Angel of Kokoda is about my uncle Bill, who was on the Kokoda track in the Second World War. The Afghanistan Pup, I don't know if you've seen that, that's around here somewhere. This studio is an absolute mess. But uh, the Afghanistan Pup is about a mate of mine, he's a teacher at Mentone Grammar. Uh, Charles is his name, and he came back from East Timor with post-traumatic stress. And I wrote that book about uh, the soldiers and the post-traumatic stress that they go through when they return. And they're supposed to go overseas and commit, um, well, you know, things against humanity that the rest of us couldn't dream of doing. Uh, and then we expect them to come back and just, you know, fit back into society and pretend it all never happened. So that was my little tribute to that. And to show kids that, these, a lot of kids I speak to, their parents are in the army. And I know up at Singleton and all those places in the Hunter Valley where I go a lot, I go into the schools up there a lot, 
A lot of those kids' fathers are soldiers and their mothers. We have women fighting on the front line now, okay? So don't deny your own family history. That can be the next best-selling book, okay? Your family history. And My Mother's Eyes, that's won me about seven awards, and it's a diary about my grandpa. That's all it is, an illustrator's diary. The writing in it's pretty, pretty crappy, to be honest. I, it's just a running narrative of where my grandpa was at any given stage, and then there's these letters that are the real story, okay? So I run the two narratives. Well, I run three narratives in every book, and that's why I get away with doing about 5,000 words in a picture book. The publishers wouldn't let me do it otherwise. It's crazy, right? But I've got the visual narrative, the pictures. I've got the written narrative that's the background to the whole story. And I've got the letters that are the emotional narrative, the first person emotional response between the person in the story and the reader. Okay. So don't worry about getting too complicated running one, two, three, four narratives. I used to be scared of having two main characters or three. I've done it about five times now. I've had two main characters, then three. Just be very careful with your balance that you give them all equal um, billing, I'll call it, okay? The only tricky thing with two characters or three characters is make sure they are all as important and that they are all individuals, just like we all are, okay? With flaws and all sorts of things. So, ready to draw? Yes, good. <laughs> Here we go, a nice big sheet of paper, nothing better. Look at that. Right. Now, we're going to, I'm going to take you through a typical session, like a typical day for me, an illustrator, okay? So I come out, I do some warm up drawings. Drawing is not something you magically do um, just out of the blue, all right? It's like playing a musical instrument or playing sport. You have to warm up. You have to do stretching exercises, blah, blah, blah. These are my little stretching exercises. I want you to do each thing I say to draw. Draw on your first sheet of paper, you'll have about six things to draw. So give them about, you know, a little space somewhere and just have a go at these. They're just to warm up. They're not important, okay? But they're things illustrators have to draw all the time. So up here on the left, right? Now, one little key to this is, I'll only give you about 30 seconds to do each one. Draw me a single human eye. A single human eye. Now, while you're drawing, and we all know how to draw these things, just draw them your way. If I show you how to draw it, you'll try and copy me. That's not what an illustrator is about. An illustrator is about you and your own emotional response to a subject and how you draw it. I'll give you an example. If you want to look at the screen for just a second, this is my mate Lee Hobbs. We went to art school together. We had eight hours of drawing a week for four years together. We sat next to each other. He draws like that and I draw like that. Hobbsy spent eight hours a week in those drawing classes for four years trying to make me laugh. <laughs> and he did. And in the process, he created Old Tom. Old Tom was rejected four times by publishers before it was picked up. It is now in its 27th edition of 27 years existence. Old Tom. And old Tom is a triangle. Have a look at him. With the top of the triangle cut off. Right? <laughs> oh dear. That's how simple it is. So if you're trying to draw an eye, realistically like I do, I'll show, oh, have I got one here? Hang on. I've got a million eyes around me here. Uh, yeah, here's one. Right? This is how I would draw an eye. Okay? I'll try and get it in close for you to see. Right, there they are, look. Realistically, right? That's realism. Old Tom's eye, have a look at it. It's a circle with a dot in the middle. That's how easy it is to illustrate a story. Okay? And I'll tell you what, Hobbsy sold on. 
a lot more copies of Old Tom than I've sold of my books combined. I think he sold more Old Toms than all mine combined, okay? He's up in the millions. I'm up in the tens of thousands. <laughs> Truly. Actually, I've just, I think I've just cracked 100,000. So I'm going to boast about that while I've got two minutes. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I couldn't believe it. That's with one publisher. Draw me. So you've drawn a human eye, right? Keep in mind, old Tom, realism, Phil, Philip Nielsen and Wombat King and all that stuff. Now, draw me a single human nose. Ah, a bit tricky. A bit tricky. A single human nose. Just have a go at it. These are just warm up drawings. Single human nose. You can do it realistically. There you are. Like young Elizabeth's nose there. Or you could do this. That's Mr. Burns' nose on The Simpsons. All right? And that artist earns a lot more than I do. <laughs> Just giving you a little perspective here, everybody. <laughs> That's what life's all about. Perspective. Draw me a single human foot. A quick one. Your third drawing. Warm-up drawing. A single human foot. But... Don't try to make it look good. You can't. Feet are ugly. That's why we hide them in shoes and socks all day. They are. They really are ugly. They're hard to paint or draw. I had to paint a surfer. Paint, uh, painting portraits is good money. But I had to paint this surfer and he had bare feet. I tried to get those feet right for about a week. Right? Ended up putting a surfboard in front of them. <laughs> Well, he was a surfer, wasn't he? Oh, you need a surfboard in there, mate. Last minute decision. Yeah, it worked. But gee, those feet, probably uh, walking over all that coral and jagged rocks and stuff. I don't know. But his feet weren't the best looking feet I've ever seen. Right, draw me a single human ear. Now, I'm getting into, these are just random thoughts. These are things that if you're an illustrator, you will draw every day in children's books, magazines, any type of illustration work you do, especially children's books, you will draw these things every day. They're parts of our characters, okay? And these are the things that make them look different. In fact, every ear is different in this world. The British police have a data bank of ear prints. That's how different they all are. They can tell a bad guy from his ear print easier than from his fingerprints. Okay. And as an illustrator, if you're a realistic one like me, you notice these things, the shape of an ear, uh, the haircut, all that stuff, realism. But even if you don't, even if you're an illustrator who does cartoon or, or Japanese style um, anime drawing, any of that sort of stuff, you still need to show the characters are different. So you have different shape ears, different shape eyes, different shape hair. And that's part of the character. You have to develop your characters so they are consistent and different to the other characters. That's really, really important. And when I do workshops for uh, illustrators that are over three or four days, we spend a whole uh, day just on character development, making one little character, even if it's a circle with two eyes, uh, looking up, looking down, running, diving, lying down, sleeping, all those things. Character development for an illustrator uh, and consistency is the number one most important thing. Have a look at any of Hobbes's books, right? If you want an example of that. Um, Fiona the pig is the best one. Fiona does all this stuff, but she is so consistent and so cute, right? My favourite children's book of all time, Fiona the pig by Lee Hobbs. Have a read of it. It's about somebody who's different, uh, i.e. Fiona. <laughs> right. Now, what you've done is use your recall. That's what an illustrator does. If you didn't, 
if you went over there and started drawing and illustrating and had to look everything up, you wouldn't make any money. So you use recall. You think, oh, what does an ear look like? Oh, yeah, that's an ear. You know, an ear. An ear is a question mark with a dot in the middle. It's that simple. So you draw it. But then when you get to the stage where you need some reference, you go and find it, i.e. at the beach. Draw me a starfish like that. Hang on, I'll try and get that up big for you. This is a real one. So I surround myself with real objects when I'm doing a book, like about a sea turtle, like this little beauty, okay? All the things that he comes in contact with, I try and get hold of to draw and paint, okay? Real objects, real things, because that's what I do. Hobbsy would just make up a starfish, right? but I don't. Draw me a shell, any type. This is just one. There are hundreds. There are cone-shaped shells like that. Okay, nice and big. There are conch shells, little ones, big ones, crazy ones. Okay. All these things are in a book somewhere, one of my books. Okay. I did a book about... Um, uh, deep Sea Whale Rescue uh, a couple of years ago with Jan Ramage and I had to do a shark close up and uh, my son came home one day and he said here dad there's your shark's tooth for reference that's a real shark's tooth and I had no idea look at the shape of it okay each side has 30 more little teeth on it So you wouldn't see that in a photograph. You can't see it. I've looked in photographs and they're not sharp enough to show it. Okay. If you can get hold of your objects, look at them. It's so much easier to illustrate. Okay. Even if you're doing cartoons, doesn't matter whatever. Okay. Use real objects as reference. And if nothing else, your little model of a sea turtle like this little one, you can get the angles you want. If you want to be looking at him coming up dramatic, full on front, from below, you can get the angles just from you. If you want him, you want to be above him while he's swimming away or something, or tumble, uh, rolling round wires, all sorts of things, trapped in fishing lines. You can do it. You can picture it by just moving your model around. So I'm surrounded. I'm surrounded by all these models every time I do a book. Okay. So this this is reference, right? Just to finish this off. Just draw me a gum leaf. This is an old dried one. This is going into a parcel. I work with the kids up at um, uh, up at a primary school at Echuca, and they send letters and parcels of dried leaves, dried gum leaves, to soldiers serving overseas, men and women. And when the soldiers get these parcels, they get the, the first thing they do. They read the letter, but they get the leaves out. They put them in a pile and they set fire to them. And the smell of the eucalyptus reminds them of home. And they reckon that's the most important thing the kids have ever sent to them. So now every parcel, the kids have to collect gum leaves and put them in the parcel. Okay. I don't know how that goes with quarantine, and, you know, our uh, quarantine laws. It's probably illegal. I'm probably telling you the wrong thing there, but. That's what they're doing. They've been doing it for years. They do it around Anzac Day and the soldiers love getting uh, letters from home and these leaves uh, and know that um, people care about what they're doing. Okay. And uh, that's our peacekeepers for you. Right now, you need a nice clean sheet of paper. So turn that sheet over. They were all just warm ups. Okay. First you use recall, then you used reference like objects. Okay. Now I'm going to show you how to create using very simple shapes. Okay. Now we'll run through a quick one first. Th this is a trick. Now is that is that board nice and clear? Because I can only see a tiny little bit of me. So you have to tell me if it's all nice and clear. All right. Okay. So I'll draw on. Hang on. The back of this one first. Nice big sheet of paper. There we go. Right. I want you to learn this shape 
but it's a tricky shape, okay? But it's a, it's a, if you can draw this shape, you can draw anything, right? So I'll do a sequence of drawings here, and I want you to copy. Do a step. It's a simple step like that, okay? You see that? So a line across, down, and across. Now, scribble over it and make it all round and soft. Right, now try and copy it as it is now. Now, I know that Yvonne's recalling, um, recording this, so if you forget any of this, lady, you can come back to it. This little thing is the key to drawing, right? So, now if you're unsure, do it again. Practice it. Now, go back to the first one and draw a straight line joining one end to the curvy bit of the other, like that. It'll make sense in a minute. Okay. Now, on the second one, where you drew it freehand, try and do it so it's a bit curvy, like that. And then the third one, make it a little bit more curvy like that. Okay. Sorry, Mark, for butting in, but you've got 10 more minutes until question time. Right, uh, 10 minutes. Oh, that's perfect. Right. Now, on either the first, second or third one, do it on through it. Put a little dot there. And then two little feet down here. And there's a very simplified bird. A preppy kid taught me that. That's how easy drawing can be. Never overcomplicate it unless you want to, like me. <laughs> That's the truth. You don't have to. And kids, kids respond to that drawing of a bird more than they respond to my three-day oil painting of a cockatoo. It's a fact. It can take you between five and ten seconds to draw it. It's art. It's expressive and it gets to the point. Don't overdo your drawings. That's how easy it is. There's old Tom's eye. And there's a bird. That's how easy drawing can be, especially for children's writing, children's books, okay? Now that shape can be anything. It's hundreds of things. Practice that shape. You draw the step first, then you draw the S, then you join it up. And it can be anything from a leaf to a bird, to a cobra snake, Hundreds of things. So if you want to be an illustrator, practice that shape. And you'll see how it works again in a second. In the middle of your sheet of paper, that was across the top, I hope. Did I say that? I hope I did. I was supposed to say draw them across the top. So if you disobeyed me, it's my fault. Right. Now, in the middle of your sheet, draw a shape like this, right? I call it the flying teardrop. This is what a teardrop looks like. But this one's flying through the air. I've shared many of these coming from the MCG after a footy match. My uh, football team has a habit of losing regularly. That's my flying teardrop as I race for that Richmond train, trying to get home. Right, now, on one end, draw a little beak like that. Now, this flying teardrop, that's the shape, right? Flying teardrop. That is the other shape. You had the little bird shape, you know, the step. This is shape number two. Practice that and you can draw anything.
teardrop and the step or the bird, okay? Now, so you've got the flying teardrop, you've got a little shape there, draw an eye there and a little smiley mouth like that. Sorry about the lines. When I moved the drawing board, it seemed, I think you're getting a few lines in it, but if I hold it still for a couple of seconds, you get a clearer picture. Okay, now, right, right in the middle of the top, just put a little fin like that. Okay. It's just a triangle, but a sort of a wonky one. Now, just behind his eye and up on the side of his body, draw another one like that. Okay, so that one's on the edge of the shape, but this, this bottom one is one of his pectoral fins that's up on the side because he's got two, okay? So down here, you just draw a little shadow of the other one, the one that's on the other side of his body. And that's how you get, with my drawing, my realism, you get perspective and shape. You try and show something that's far away on the other side or the end of the body or the shape, whatever it is. And that's how your ima the imagination of your viewer takes over and says, oh, yeah, it's a round shape and there's a little fin on the other side. Okay, now, this, is a, this brings us back to our little step, right? So there was our step, like that. Then we turned it into this beautiful shape like that. And we turned that into this beautiful shape like that. And that is half of his tail fin, okay? And then that's one half of his tail. Then we do it upside down. It's a bit trickier, like that. So you've got the flying teardrop. You've got the step turned into the bird, turned into the dolphin's fin. Those two shapes are in just about every second thing you'll ever draw. So if you're sitting watching telly and you've got a piece of paper and a pencil near you, you just practice a little bit. Oh, yeah, that's right. Can you do it? Yeah, there he is. In fact, a little kid asked me the other day, he said, oh, what else can you turn it into? Can you turn it into a plane? I did. So there's our little thing there. I put wings out here. I put a cockpit up here, little tail plane, some little wings out the back and some... I had some people there coming down, some windows. He said, oh, yeah, very clever. So it can, that, those two shapes can be just about anything you want them to be. Right. Now, we're going to do a very quick... We've got about five minutes, haven't we? Is that correct, Yvonne? Yep, good. Right. We'll start a drawing. And I start this late because I want you to finish it later. Ah, see, you never get out of homework. doesn't matter how old you get. I hated homework, and it's the first thing I give any kids that I have a session with. <laughs> yeah, you're going to do homework today, Sonny. Yeah, so there. Right. So, right in the middle of your page, just draw, but with lots of space around it, draw a smiley mouth. But it's on an angle, so you've got a straight line, you've got plenty of room, that end, that end, above and below. Now, on top of that smiley mouth, just put like another lip so it turns into a mouth. Okay? So now, at one end, just touching it and down a little bit on the whole shape, draw a nice big circle. Like that. Okay? Now, I'll hold it up here so I'm not moving it too much. All right, because then it changes the light that you're seeing. Right. Next, join those two shapes with a little flowy line like that, and then put a dot there. Okay, so that could be, this could still be a hundred creatures from a, a bug, a rhinoceros bug, up to, um, i.e. a sea turtle. Right there on that little spot, draw a lovely big shape like half a banana.
Now, if your drawing doesn't look like mine, doesn't matter. All shapes, all, all turtles are all shapes. Shapes, sizes, patterns, it doesn't matter. And Hobbsy, I'm sure if he was drawing a sea turtle, it would look nothing like this. So just draw in your own style, your way. In fact, try to make it your own, not like mine, okay? Now up here, but smaller, draw the other half of the banana. And that's what I do. I try and create perspective, okay? I try to make things look real. So things that are close to you are big in your vision. Things are a long way away. On the other side of the turtle, for instance, it's smaller. So that's the, uh, your perspective rule. Right, now very quickly, add a nose, like a hawk's nose. And we start turning our shapes, simple shapes, into a turtle. So everything starts with these very simple shapes. You get them right and your drawing's easy, okay? You have to practice, as I said, but then you think, oh yeah, that's easy. I'll move on to something a bit harder. I'll try a giraffe today, something like that, okay? They are hard to draw <laughs> giraffes. Try drawing a horse's head and then try drawing a giraffe and he's got those little horns as well. So there is. Now, you know how to draw an eye. You drew one before. So you need a nice big eye down there like that. Just scribble it in like that. Now, you're drawing a loggerhead sea turtle. They have a massive head. They are one of the biggest and strongest of all the sea turtles. They are critically endangered. Okay? So I've got to look after them. Now, the beautiful thing about sea turtles, you could do that. I could finish this realistically, right? Or, now, if you do it realistically, you'll have a look at the back of his body there. They are sort of hexagons. Now, a hexagon is like this. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's the shape that is part of sea turtle's back. All the shapes on their head and that are different. But I'll show you how to do that. In the middle of his back, um, firstly, just draw a little line around the edge like that. Right? Little line around the edge. Just following like a little train track. And then in the middle of the, his back, draw a house. Like a little preppy wood. But leave enough room under it house. So above that line you've got a little house and below it you've got a reflection of it. Okay. And then each of the points of that hexagon you just run a little line out to the side like that. Now that's if you're drawing realistically. If you're not you make up everything. Right. Now to, I'll show you realism. Sea turtles have patterns, but they're all different. Every single sea turtle pattern is different. So you make them up like this, like I'm making, right? But you're an artist. You're illustrating a children's book. And you can draw patterns, make patterns up like these beautiful patterns on this sea turtle I found in Fiji. Look at that. Nothing like a real sea turtle, is it? But how good does it look? Beautiful. Okay. So once again, Use your imagination. Now, I had some kids drawing this turtle last week, and I said, right, now, you, draw, you do the patterns your own way. And the teacher said, no, we're going to do them realistically. So she got all these photographs of real sea turtles, all sorts of stuff. And every kid who came in with his drawing had little stars and diamonds and all sorts of stuff. They were kids. They couldn't help themselves using their imagination. That's what you have to keep when you're an adult, illustrating for kids. You have to remember that they like to see you use your imagination. They like that world. And that's what you have to stay in touch with if you're writing for kids and illustrating for them. Now, so I'd put more, I'd put some little lines around the edge, bang like that. I would do lovely big patterns on these flippers, uh, sometimes jelly bean shapes. Sometimes funny little uh, rectangles, whatever, like that. And there are the patterns. He would have two little back flippers, just a shape like that. There's one of the back flippers, little shape like that, just like shape like that. And up here, almost a half a hot dog shape. That's all they are. But they're not important to your picture, so you can just scribble them in 
like that. Just scribble and it works, okay? So you take all these little shortcuts, things in the background, not important, okay? But you're an illustrator, you need to tell a story. This is a sea turtle on white paper. That's not good enough for a picture book. He needs to be in the water. So two big scribbly lines showing over his flippers, showing he or she is in the water like that. Okay. And if you're like me and you're trying to tell the kids a message about um, endangered species, you draw a little seashell here and you draw an arrow between the sea turtle and that. Then you make them put down their pens and pencils and you tell them that sea turtle eats seashells. He crunches it up and it floats around in the ocean around him and all the other little fishies come and eat it. Pure calcium. He is a cornerstone species. C-O-R-N-E-R, -E cornerstone species. Without the sea turtles, whole parts of the ocean will die. Okay, this is crucial to life on earth. The oceans feed two thirds of the world's population. It starts with a seashell and it starts with one of the oldest creatures on earth eating it, providing calcium for whole ecosystems in the seas and the oceans. Without that, we won't exist as a human race. It's always through the whole system down to the tiniest little thing, seashell. Okay? They're the things I look for in my books, in my stories. They are the important things. It's all in the detail. Somebody told me that years ago. Not sure what I was doing, but they did tell me that. And I've never forgotten. Now, do you want to yes, do a yes. question and answer? Yes. Sorry, I was just about to butt in. I can yes. see uh, lots of people still drawing away. So I love that when people are listening and doodling. Yes. So we've got some questions coming in. And um, uh, first of all, one is from Jenny, who got in quick, who wanted to know how you dis discovered the story of Rachel Pratt in the first place. Reading, reading, reading. Remember one of my four tips of writing? Read everything you can lay your hands on. I've got, I'm reading four books at once, which is pretty stupid, really. <laughs> I do actually lose track and have to go back uh, probably three or four pages in some of them, especially if it's historical fiction and it's about a battle or something. Um, I do lose track, but I just cannot help myself. I pick up newspapers, um, everything. I, I just go over to my shelf and often uh, the spine of a book will attract me. I'll pull it out and read some of it. So it's just this reading, 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 okay? Right. Um, does that explain question, it? Yeah, there's more questions coming in. Yep. Um, Angela Sunday has a practical question, um, which we actually talked about previously uh, before we got on. What are the most common internet platforms used when presenting online sessions in schools? Um, equal, it's actually, I've done about 24 in the last three weeks. It's equal to three front runners of Zoom, Google Meets, uh, Microsoft Team, and occasionally WebEx. Good. That's good. No Skype. Not one school Skypes. Oh, that's interesting, isn't it? Um, no, I don't know why. I think it's security or something. There's no security with it. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I, I don't Thank know you. why. I'm the least tech person you'll ever come across. You're doing an amazing job. All right, we've got another one from Marge Gibbs. Mark, one single spread. How long does the paint work take you? Ah, all right. I'll show you. Glad you asked. <laughs> Usually this is another session when I do just a purely illustration session, right? A piece of artwork. This is in A New Prayer for the Animals, right? The book I showed you before. This painting's in it, right? Starts with a sketch. There's your sea turtle. We all just did one so you know what's involved. Then I block in very roughly with watercolour paint. I wet the whole sheet and just wet my brush in blue and smear it on. All right? That's blocked. Then I do some detail in pencil. They're just grey lead and coloured doant pencils. Okay? That's the block in. And it looks pretty average, doesn't it? But then... 
it turns into that with the detail. That takes me two days. From there to that finished artwork being parceled up and sent off to the to the scanner. Okay. So wow. two, three days. Um, the cover for Rachel, Rachel Pratt, the war nurse story I just told you about, that cover, I'll show you how that works. Hang on a tick. That took me probably five days and her, her expression still isn't right. Okay. I'm going to change that. Okay. Now, Let's do, now I wanted her to look calm, but I wanted to look calm and determined, but there's something wrong. So I'm getting my niece, who's my model for that. I, I get clothes from the op shop, I dress them up and I paint them here. They're real models. That's my niece and my nephew. They're actors. <laughs> well, I actually had an argument with Jenny about one of your books um, the other day because I said, oh, I think that's Photoshop. That one. <laughs> And of no course, it isn't. It, you use models and you're just really realistic. But you had me fooled. It was yeah, so realistic that I thought that Photoshop. People, people think I've, I use Photoshop. I haven't got Photoshop and I don't know how to use it. <laughs> As you've got a normal computer. The only um, drawing program I use is Microsoft Paint. Wow. It's that old fashioned, simple one. And that's yeah. only. That's only to put maybe a little bit of background in before it's uh, scanned and set off. That's all. All right, we're going to move on because there's, there's, there's heaps more um, questions coming in. Uh, do you try to link your book subjects to the Australian curriculum, Melissa Salisbury asks? No, I'm just... just um, it, it's very funny because my books, a lot of them were out there when they develop this new national curriculum and I got an email from a publisher said oh Mark the, the national curriculum have picked up seven, seven of your books and uh, they all fitted into it Journey of the Sea Turtle, My Mother's Eyes, First World War, um, uh, Beth with um, pre and post uh, European settlement, uh, the study of the Aborigines obviously because there's bits in Beth about that how they're scared of the Aboriginal people, but then realise they don't have to be, uh, et cetera. So they've fitted in. Now, I, um, I just, I wanted to do the gold fields uh, because of my mate, um, and that fitted in. I wanted to do the first schoolhouse about uh, the youngest convict to come with the first fleet, a uh, little Tom, and um, that fitted in as well. So I do the stories and then they fit them in, I think. It just seems like they overlap nicely, don't they? You seem to be interested in things that sort of match with the... Well, keep in mind, when I started, there were no books on Australian... No picture books on Australian history anywhere. Wow. Mine were the first. And that's why I started doing them, because my son came home from, from Karingal. Um, we live in Frankston. He went to Karingal High School. And he got to Form 5, you know, Year 11, he hadn't studied one moment of Australian history oh. in 12 years of school. Yeah. Not a moment. Wow. And I said, right, well, get our Australian history out there. It was that simple. Well, that sort of leads us to our next question because obviously there are more books um, being published. And Fiona West would like to know who you think are the best publishers to approach for historical picture books. My, the best publisher, well, I work for four publishers, so I can't call one of them the best. Because <laughs> get back to them. <laughs> so I'll say my four favourites are four publishers. Hash, Susanne O'Sullivan. They take my real history ones. All... All the ones you saw before, they're taking this one too. It's finished. It's actually printed. It's coming out early next year. Right? Rachel Pratt. Um, so, Hash Editor and Sullivan is my editor. Um, Windy Hollow Books. Christina Pace. Christina Pace. P-A-S-E. Right? She is fabulous. She takes any of my books that Hachette knocked back, my Australian history one. I wouldn't and she said oh we'd love to do it 
So that's why a new prayer for the animals came out. Hachette did the first one, didn't want to do a second one, but Wendy Hollow picked it up, okay? Then you've got Ford Street, who I joined with the very first time ever last night. That's Paul Collins. And I work for Lisa Berriman and Jackie French at um, HarperCollins as an illustrator. They're not interested in my writing, but they uh, love my illustrations. And I love working with Jackie, so I'm quite happy to do that. Well, that's Even a, though I'm a control freak. It is a really good insight. Thanks for sharing that uh, with us. Uh, Kay Bailey, Bailey has a question. Mark, when writing in third person about a real person, I sometimes lose the ability to stay close to my person. I don't like, uh, it's like I pull the camera back and lose that closeness. Do you have any tips on staying close to a third person point of view personal? Um, base your character on a real person. I get kids and adults to do this in my, in my writing workshops, right? You want a good character for your story. Kids book, novel, anything. Interview a real person. Somebody you know, somebody up the coffee shop, so, oh, look, would you be interested in me basing my character? If you know, if you go to a coffee shop every day like I do, you know everybody in there is probably more than you know your own family. And you say, oh, that woman's interesting. I'll base my character on her. You sit them down and you ask them these three crucial questions in an interview format. One, what is on your bedside table at night when you go to bed? Those objects make your character real. I've got a toy, I've got a toy, a little um, a turtle. I found my granddaughter bought that for me in Fiji, okay? That comes out of my pocket. I carry that with me to remind me every day of what I do and why I do it. Little sea turtle, right? I've got the shark's tooth that goes around my neck every day. I didn't put it around my neck today because I wanted to bring it close to the camera to show you, okay? They go onto my bedside table. My book, not this one, it's actually called Warlord by um, uh, another author. The book goes on my bedside table. There is a lamp, a glass of water, my watch and something else. These are the objects that make your character real, okay? Number two, their music. Everybody will tell you retro music has been used too much as a background for a character. He's singing Bob Dylan again. You know, he's singing the Beatles again. He's singing, doing Led Zeppelin. He's doing an air guitar and, you know, Mick Fleetwood, whatever. Retro music is not bad. All music is, we all relate to it. So your character has to have some music in their system somehow. Okay. Number four, they have to be flawed. My floor is on a control freak, right? I am obsessive about detail. It's a flaw. It's a problem. I don't need it. So, to answer the question, interview a real person, ask those four questions and any others you think your character needs because of his setting, uh, historical or whatever, okay? So, interview a real person. That's what I do. All my characters in all my books may be very simple. They're only picture books, okay? But they are actually real people. Great. Th thank you for that. Um, Melissa Ray has a question. How do you feel about carrying the responsibility of writing about topics that have sensitivity? Um, I think it's my duty um, to tell the truth. Uh, I think a lot of books in the past, especially picture books, especially picture books um, uh, being about our history and truthful about it, they still, they still gloss over things, okay? Kids are aware of all the ups and downs. The picture book has gone past being this fun fantasy little thing um, that little kids relate to, and it still is for little kids, but older kids want something with meat in it. They know realism, they know the world and its problems. They don't want to be um, preached to or spoken down to 
even in a picture book format. They, don't, they expect to be treated as an adult and they deal with adult themes all the time. If you don't, you just walk into Big W, go into the book section and have a look at the um, young adult section, right? And the themes in there. You've got vampires and all sorts of, of stuff, right? They are being read by the kids in high school, not by, you know, 20, 30 year olds. Young adult fiction is teenagers and younger. They're starting to read that sort of material, the young adult fiction, in grade five and six. And I know because I ask. Sorry, I was muted. We've just got a couple more questions and we've got two minutes. <laughs> so the pressure is on. Uh, what would be your advice if the period you are researching is very remote and primary sources are scarce? Make it up. <laughs> there you go. I just I didn't hesitate. <laughs> Hang on. Ooh. Hmm. I'm thinking about that. No, make it up. It's All right. Okay, we've got to move on because you know, otherwise we've got to I just want to get these last uh couple of questions. Uh Peter Taylor. I have written for a wordless picture book set in nineteen twenty about a father driving a bullock, bullock team on a six week trip and his family waiting for his return. How much illustration research should I provide to the publisher slash illustrator? As much as you think he needs. Heaps, in other words. I'm a control freak and if I was an author and had to hand over my book to someone else, I would be a metal case. I would, I would tell them exactly how the wheels on that cart should look. Wow. I would tell them exactly what the whip would be made of. Everything, the harness for the bullocks, the boots the bloke's wearing, okay? Everything. Detail, that's my thing, I love it. But if I was an author, and, and I know authors keep telling me, I have to let it go, I have to let it go all the time. I couldn't, I couldn't. It, we get told sometimes that the, um, you know, the publishers just throw our illustration notes away. So <laughs> probably, yeah, probably yeah. do. But um, at least you've done your, uh, you know, duty of care. You've put everything in there that you can, right? Yeah. Look, if, if it's a, like Peter, if it's a um, historical novel and it's a, an actual person or, you know, it's close to a real person in history, then you provide the reference and say, look, he has to look like this. You know, he has to have a jacket like that. He has to have a shirt without a collar exactly like that. You can supply that because it's an actual historical figure or the little boy in Never Lose Hope. It's based on the boy who was on the first fleet, the youngest boy on the fleet. And he's the character. So his clothes had to be what that little boy would have worn. And Isabella Sesson, the, uh, the convict teacher, I had to I had to find out as much as I could about her. I couldn't find photographs, obviously, or even drawings of her. But I knew what everybody else wore. Okay, so I used that. That's what you could supply and say that this is what the person has. These people have to be wearing. Okay. Again, a great answer. Thank you. And the last question. Uh, which sort of relates to that. Do you lose creative freedom in your manuscript or illustrations if you use traditional publishers? So is the creative freedom different? They try um, to manipulate your story often. I have, um, I often have a sad ending. Somebody dies, somebody doesn't, right? And often they're open-ended. So the kids have to make up their own mind. If the little, if the soldier at the end of uh, Angel of Kokoda disappears into the mist and dies or disappears into the mist and lives. Okay. So I have the, my publisher doesn't like me to have them anymore. Yeah. So I have to fight. And that can be two pages, two fills captures of explanations of why that locket has to stay in Eureka. They tried to take the locket out of the story, the device, that held the whole story together, the little one um, little device that she, the girl has from her mother, they wanted it out of the story, okay? And I wrote two pages explaining, no, it's got to stay in. 
uh, with no, I think, after the end of the two page, so they had to read it first. Great. All right, we're going to leave it there because we're three minutes over time. I would like to thank you very much on behalf of everyone here for your words of wisdom um, and for letting us share the video as well. So we'll do our little right links thank you by wriggling our hands and just imagine the sounds and the oohs and the ahs. Um, okay. Yes, thank you very much. And yep. thank you, thank you all for um, sticking around. I didn't, I didn't actually see anybody get up and leave, even for a cup of tea. <laughs>